All right, we're back again in video number 26. Recall that our goal is to classify a Landsat image of Yellowstone and try to identify burned areas versus unburned areas. In the last video, I gave you an introduction to what classification is and how we can basically do it in NV and ArcMap. In this video, I'm going to show you how to evaluate spectral separability between your training areas. And that's basically the first step in trying to figure out whether you're going to be able to actually classify different end members. So I'll show you how to create a vector file. Then I'll show you how to trace your training polygons. Uh, so actually identify what your end member surfaces are going to be, convert those to regions of interests, and then extract and plot the spectra from those regions of interest. I'll note that we have basically done this already in previous videos. So you may already know how to do this. You may be able to skip this video. But if you don't, follow along. And here we go. So I've got my NV project open already. Here's my map of Yellowstone. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new vector file that I'm going to use to trace my polygons. And I'll call it Yellowstone end members. Now, using this tool, I can actually create the polygons. I'm going to create one for each type of land surface that I want to identify. So the first type of land surface I want to identify is going to be burned areas. And I'm going to pick a pretty broad burned patch to try to actually capture the full variability in that. I'll click this button, Vector Create. And I'll draw a nice big polygon. Encompasses this kind of darker color and this lighter color. It's important to get all that variability in um, if you want to be able to classify all those different areas. OK, so I know now my first polygon was burned areas. And I'm going to keep track of these as I go along. OK, my second area is going to be trees, so unburned trees. And to do that, I will choose, I think I'll choose this area. OK. Next, I'll put in a category for bare bedrock. And I saw a nice bedrock area down here. So I'll just circle this whole thing. So third category is bedrock. Fourth category is going to be water. I'll go over to Yellowstone Lake. Notice some areas are light, some are dark. I'm going to go ahead and take a big polygon that gets a lot of the dark areas, but also gets a lot of the lighter areas. Make sure I get that all that spectral variability. And finally, I'm going to have a category called meadows. These nice light green meadows are fairly unique, and there's quite a few of them. So try to get a lot of that. OK, so I've got my five different end member training polygons now. Burned areas, unburned trees, bedrock, water, and meadows. Note that I did deliberately did not select any areas in shadows. So there's a lot of mountainous topography over here. And there's burned areas in the shadows. There's rocks in the shadows. Those are going to have really different spectral reflectance. So just be aware that because we haven't included those shadowed areas in our training polygons, we're really not going to have any ability to spectrally classify those shadowed areas. And we may miss them in our classification. So if you were doing this for real, you might want to take the time to go ahead and, and actually collect training polygons in those shadowed areas. OK, so for now, I'm going to save my training polygons. I'm going to save them in my output folder, call them end members 2. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is actually label these in the attribute table. So I'll right click. And I'll go View Edit Attributes. And I'm going to go File, 
actually options, add columns. I can name the column. I'll call it surface. Make it 20 characters long. It's a string as opposed to a number. So I'll hit OK. Remember, my first area was burned, trees. OK, so when I've got all those entered in, I'm just going to hit Save. It'll resave. It's going to copy over it. So now I've got those names in my attribute table, so I know which polygon is which. OK, so the next step is to convert this vector file into a region of interest. To do that, I'm going to go down here to Vector, Convert Vector to ROI, choose my shape file that I just made, choose Unique Records, then I'll choose Surface, which is the column or category I just made, and hit OK. So here come my regions of interest. And you can see they're each being filled in with their own individual color. Here's meadow, here's lake. So the next step is to extract the average spectral signature from each of these. So keep in mind what's happening here. Within this polygon, we've got hundreds of individual pixels. And for each pixel, there's seven different bands. So what Envy's going to do now is average all the pixels within this polygon and give us out the average value for each of the bands. And the way to do that is to right click and go to Stats. It will compute them. Of course, it shows it as a plot here. But it also shows us this statistical summary. And so what we're going to do is actually just copy this statistical summary and try to make sure you get a nice, clean, even block like I just did. Then I'll hit Control C. I'm going to go, I'm going to start a new project in Excel. And I'm going to paste this right in. And notice because I had the clean block, it pasted right into the cells. If you're not getting it pasting right into the cells, you may need to make sure you're getting a clean copy. Uh, if that's not working, you can also use data text to columns which will allow you to uh, break it out into different columns. And so importantly, we just copied the data for the surface type water. Okay, So I'm going to put that heading right here. Maybe I'll make it bold to remind myself. I'm also going to put headings up here, band. This was minimum. This was maximum. This was mean. And this was the one sigma standard deviation. OK, so I got my headings there. All right, so what I'd like you to do now, and what I'm going to do, is actually copy the data from all five of our end member polygons. So we'll have all of our average statistics here in Excel. OK, so I've copied all my data into Excel. I've got my water, my trees, meadow, burned area, and bedrock. OK, so our next step is to plot the data. To do that, I'm going to highlight my first set, which is water. I'm going to go Insert, Line. I like to use the line graph with the dots on it. So that's my first data set. That's water that I just plotted. And now I can go to Select Data, and I can edit and change the name to water. That looks great. Now I'm going to add some new data. This one's going to be trees. I'll click here, and that'll let me highlight that set of means. And I'm going to go ahead and add data for the three other uh, surface types, and you should too. OK, so now I've got my five categories, and I've loaded the mean digital numbers for each category. So I'll hit OK. Here's my plot. And right away, we can see that the spectra do look generally similar, but there's some important differences, um, including really right kind of in bands 2 through 5, we're seeing some pretty interesting spectral differences that could be 
important. So to make this a true spectral separability plot, we need to actually plot the standard deviations on this plot. Those are basically the errors. And what's that? that's going to show us the range of data. Okay. Notice that for each of these bands, there's a mean, but there's also a minimum and a maximum. There's a range around that mean value. The lowest pixel in the polygon gave 14 for band 2. The highest gave 23 for band 2. The average was 19. And so we want to, to determine whether water might be spectrally separable from trees. We'll need to plot some measure of that uncertainty on our graph so we can see whether the lines are really statistically different from one another or whether they overlap. So to do that, we're going to add error bars and we're going to use the standard deviation as our error bar. So the way to add error bars is to click off the plot, then click on the plot so you've just got the gray area highlighted. Go to Layout up top, Error Bars, and then More Error Bar Options. I'm going to choose Water for my first series. And I'm going to go down to Custom specify value and basically again I'm going to choose the whole column of standard deviations for my positive error bar choose it again for my negative error bar so we're getting plus or minus one standard deviation so notice it did actually add the error bars but they're so small we can't see them so go ahead now repeat that process and add error bars onto all four of the other surface types and then we'll see what's spectrally separable. OK, so now I've got error bars on all my data. And what you can see makes a lot of sense. Looking at water, the error bars are so small we can't even see them. What that means is that all the pixels of water had reflectances or radiances or digital numbers that were really, really similar to one another. So the the spread in the data is very tight. In contrast, the pixels within the meadow polygon gave back a whole range of digital numbers. And they're encompassed within this standard deviation and beyond. So meadow is a, is a surface type that has a lot of variability in its spectral reflectance characteristics. And that may make it a little bit tougher to discriminate from some of the others. but. Notice there's a lot of places where it doesn't overlap. So in band four, meadow does not statistically overlap bedrock at the one sigma level. But of course, once you're up here at band five, uh, bedrock and meadow do overlap each other at the one sigma statistical level. So they would not really be spectrally different here. So what I'm going to do now is take a minute and I'm going to think of a bunch of band ratios that I can actually use to potentially spectrally separate these different units from one another. And then I'm going to use those band ratios as criteria in a decision tree classifier in the next video. So after spending some time with the data, I've identified four band ratios that I think are going to allow me to distinguish all five of these different units from one another. And so the way I approach this problem, I just looked at the spectra. And I thought, OK, what are, what's going to be the easiest to separate? The two things that jumped out of my eye were water down here and meadow up here. So those are really different from the other three. So I started with water. And I said, all right, what ratio can I use to distinguish water from the others? And I picked the ratio of band 1 over band 7, which is really high for water at 8.67. The next highest is 2.19 for trees. So I know I can separate water just using that combination. And then all those pixels will be removed from further consideration. So now let's go after meadow. For meadow, I picked the ratio of band 3 over band 4, because I can see that the meadow spectra jumps up here, has this very steep slope which none of the other spectra have. 
So by ratioing band 3 over 4, I computed about 0 0.3 for meadow. The next closest is trees, which does this jump here, which is around 0 0.63. So I'm going to be able to distinguish meadow by its low ratio of band 3 to 4. OK, so that leaves me now with three others to distinguish. Trees, burned, and bedrock. So now keep in mind, I don't need to distinguish these from water or meadow. I just need to distinguish them from each other now. So looking at these, uh, I was next able to distinguish burned from trees and bedrock by looking at the ratio of band 4 over 6. So looking at burned, that's here in purple. It has a pretty steep increase between band 4 and band 6. It goes way up. It's the highest in 6, and it's one of the lowest in 4. So the ratio of 4 to 6 is 0 0.2. The next closest ratio is for trees, which was 0 0.37. So burned pixels are going to have the lowest 4 to 6 ratio. I can cull those off. Now finally, I only have to distinguish trees from bedrock. To do that, I chose the ratio of band 4 to 5, recognizing that bedrock, here in light blue, has a much steeper descent between band 4 and 5 than does trees here in red. So ratioing 4 to 5 for bedrock, I get 0 0.596, which is a little bit lower than trees. Now importantly, I believe that all these are spectrally separable. And I think I'm going to have the most trouble separating trees from bedrock. Because if you look at trees in red and bedrock in light blue, they are very, very similar in shape. And I'm really only going to be exploiting this slight difference between them where bedrock is a little bit steeper between band 4 and 5. So that wraps up our section on spectral separability. You've learned how to create a vector file, trace your polygons, convert them to ROIs, and then extract and plot the spectra, and also come up with criteria for how to separate them. So join us for our next video, where I'll show you how to actually use these criteria in a decision tree to classify our image. Thanks for listening.